In this video, we're going to talk in general about bandstop filters, but we're going to focus most of our attention on a second order notch filter. And there's lots of references out there that cover what a notch filter is and how to design one. But in this video, I want to approach it in a slightly different way than most of them. The goal of this video is to give you a little insight about how each of the terms in a second order bandstop filter contribute to the shape and location of the notch. That way, when you come across a transfer function in the future, maybe you'll have a little more intuition into what it's doing. So I hope you stick around for it. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. Bandstop filters attenuate, or mostly remove a block of frequencies from a signal and pass through the other frequencies nearly unaltered. These regions are called the stop band and the pass bands. You may also hear these filters called band reject filters, but I'm going to stay with band stop because I like that term a little better. Now, the width of a band stop filter is the distance between the lowest frequency and the highest frequency blocked. And as you might expect, as filter designers, we can adjust the width of the stop band and place it where we need to remove any troublesome frequencies in our signal. So with that in mind, a notch filter is simply the name given to a really narrow band stop filter one that attempts to attenuate just a few hertz or so. Notch filters are useful if you want to filter out very specific noise. Like, for example, you can use a notch to filter out the 60 hertz noise that comes from an AC power source and can show up as an audible hum in audio equipment. Or, in the control world, perhaps a sensor is attached to a flexible structure, and you don't want that resonant frequency coupling through the controller, which then commands the actuators at that frequency, which might further excite the flexible mode, causing an unstable feedback loop, or at the very least, reduced performance. In this case, again, notching out that flexible structural mode in your controller might help alleviate this problem. All right, so now that we kind of understand the basic idea of notch filters and bandstop filters, let's look at whether there's an intuitive way to think about what these filters are doing by building up the transfer function with really basic building blocks. Common sense would tell us that we could create a bandstop filter by combining a low pass filter and a high pass filter together. And at first glance, this makes a lot of sense. We can take a signal, pass it through a low pass filter to keep the low frequencies, and pass it through a high pass filter to keep the high frequencies, and then sum the results. This would block the batch of frequencies that don't make it through either filter. In this case, something like 10 radians per second would be too high for the low pass and too low for the high pass, and therefore wouldn't make it into the filtered signal. Now, this is true for an ideal filter, where the stop band perfectly attenuates a signal. However, for practical implementations, this is not the case. For a first order low pass filter, frequencies lower than the cutoff frequency would pass through nearly unaltered, but for frequencies above the cutoff, the amplitude would fall off at 20 decibels per decade. So frequencies are attenuated more the further away they are from the cutoff frequency. Now, the first order high pass filter would be the mirror of that. It would pass through high frequencies nearly unaltered, and the lower frequency amplitudes are the ones that would fall off at 20 dB per decade. And if we add a low pass and high pass transfer function together and solve some of the algebra, we get a second order bandstop transfer function, and it looks similar to what I wrote out at the start of this video. And this bandstop filter that we created will produce a frequency magnitude response that looks like this V shape. So thinking of a bandstop filter as the combination of both a high pass and low pass filter seems to work. Easy enough, right? Well, the problem with this idea is that we don't have control over the depth of the stop band. The amount of attenuation with this method depends on how wide the stop band is in the first place. As we bring the two filters closer to each other, the V in the middle becomes more shallow. And this is a problem. Here, let me show you what I mean by plotting this in MATLAB. I'll build a low pass filter with cutoff at 1 radian per second and a high pass filter with cutoff at 100 radians per second. So the band stop width would be two decades from 1 to 100. The frequency response for this transfer function looks a lot like what we expected, right? There's the V there, and the middle of the band is attenuated by almost 35 decibels, which is pretty good. But now, what happens when I move the low pass and high pass filters inward so that the band is between, say, 5 and 20 radians per second? The stop band is still centered at 10 radians per second, but you can see that the attenuation has dropped to only about 8 decibels. 
And you could probably imagine that the attenuation will drop to almost nothing if we wanted a filter that targets a band of 1 or 2 radians per second using this method. So the concept of a low-pass filter added to a high-pass filter doesn't hold too well for a narrow band filter. Therefore, we're going to have to think about this in a different way. Let's start with that standard second-order low-pass filter transfer function. The one that's just omega n squared divided by s squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared, where omega n is the natural frequency and zeta is the damping ratio. This has two poles that we can move around by adjusting omega n and zeta. For now, I'll just set the natural frequency to 10 radians per second and a damping ratio of 1 which means that this is a perfectly damped system and there's a double pole at s equals minus 10. The Bode plot for this transfer function is as you might expect if you are familiar with this already. It's a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 10 radians per second and the gain falls off at minus 40 decibels per decade. This minus 40 is because we have two more poles than zeros and for every extra pole, the magnitude drops by an additional negative 20 dB per decade. Now let's lower the damping ratio from 1 to 0 0.5. And we can see that the poles move closer to the imaginary axis along the constant damping line, which means that there's also an imaginary component to them. The gain ever so slightly is greater than 0 dB, pretty close to the natural frequency before falling off again at minus 40 dB per decade. This means that if we input a sine wave into this system at around 7 radians per second, the amplitude of that output sine wave will be slightly larger than the input. Now let's drop the damping even more to 0 0.1. And you can see that the peak is even higher, and it's narrower. And if we remove damping from this system altogether and set zeta equals 0, we get an undamped second order transfer function. The two poles lie right on the imaginary axis, and the frequency response for this system has an extremely narrow peak with an infinite gain right at the natural frequency. This is a system that you'd want to avoid in real life because of how grossly underdamped it is. But this is a good starting point for thinking about our notch filter. What we can do is flip this response upside down by inverting the transfer function. So now instead of two poles on the imaginary axis, we'll have two zeros, and our transfer function will be s squared plus 100 divided by 100. And look at that. Instead of creating a huge amount of gain at the natural frequency, we now have a system that almost completely attenuates it. And that's pretty much what we want in a notch filter. And what's nice about this is that we can adjust the damping term in the numerator to affect the depth of the notch in the same way that we adjusted it to affect the height of the peak in the inverse function. Except there's two problems with this transfer function. One, it's not passing the high frequency signals through unaltered. There's this gain that's rising up at 40 dB per decade, since there's two unanswered zeros now. And two, it's not a realizable transfer function because the order of the numerator is greater than the denominator. But we can fix both of those problems by adding two poles to the system. Each pole will drag the high frequency magnitude down by 20 dB per decade, and it'll be flat like we want. But the question is, where should we place these two poles? Well, let's open up the Control System Designer app with our transfer function H and use the Bode plot editor so that we can see real time how adding poles affects the frequency response. I'm going to add my first pole just randomly in this high frequency area. And you can see that it bent this part of the gain plot. The frequency is higher than where I placed the pole. It bent it down that additional 20 dB per decade. This is because we've accounted for one of the extra zeros. And I can add a second pole in another random spot and see that this one also bends the gain plot down the final 20 dB per decade so that the high frequency gain is flat. However, it's not at zero decibels, which is what we need so that the high frequency signals are just passed through and the amplitude is not modified in any way. So here's how we can fix this. If I take one of the poles and start to move it, you can see that the gain line starts to move with it. And eventually it moves down to zero decibels when the pole is exactly the same distance from the notch as the other pole is in log space. 
So say we put a pole at 100 radians per second, we need a complementary pole at 1 radian per second so that each pole is exactly one decade away from the notch, or a ratio of 10. And to make the notch narrower, we can move both poles inward. In this way, we have control over the width of the notch without changing the notch location or affecting the low and high frequency gain. And the transfer function math works out as well. I'll start by defining the variable a as the ratio that each pole is away from the natural frequency, so that the larger values correspond with a wider notch. Now we can create a lightly damped pair of zeros centered at the natural frequency to get our unrealizable transfer function and the start of our notch. Then we can add the first pole with cutoff frequency a times larger than the natural frequency, and another pole a times smaller than the natural frequency. And what we end up with is our second order band stop filter. And if we plot the frequency response for this filter, you can see the characteristic V shape centered right at the natural frequency. And this is how I like to think of a notch filter transfer function. Rather than a high pass and low pass filter that are added together, I think it makes more sense to think of it as a pair of undamped or very lightly damped zeros to produce that notch. And then the damping ratio sets the depth and the natural frequency term places the center of the notch. Then we add two poles to make the system realizable, and importantly, it gives us control over the width of the notch. So we can set the width by adjusting A, we can set the depth with zeta, and we can move the notch around by adjusting omega in. All right, now that we understand how adjusting the transfer function impacts the location and shape of the stop band, the last thing I want to show you is that we can design a notch filter graphically with the Control System Designer app with a single click. I'll relaunch the app with no baseline transfer function so that the magnitude and phase are both zero. Now if I right click in the editor window and select add pole or zero, I can choose a notch filter. And now I can just click where I want to place it. You can see that in the lower left, the value of the compensator C is the second order transfer function for this notch. And by grabbing the red marker, I can move the notch around and change the depth. Basically, I'm adjusting the natural frequency and the damping ratio by doing this. Then if I grab either of the two black markers, I can adjust the width of the notch. This is the same as moving the two poles around. And notice that they move together. And if you're not into making changes graphically, you can just right click and select Edit Compensator to adjust the values directly. All right, that's where I'm gonna leave this video. Hopefully it's helped a little bit to add some intuition around the notch filter transfer function. And if you don't wanna miss other videos like this in the future, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Also, if you wanna check out my channel, Control System Lectures, I cover more control theory topics there as well. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.